All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 2, Section 3, Challenges to Spain's Supremacy. So we covered back in Chapter 1, let's get the right color here, uh, Spanish Conquest of the New World and how that led to really a golden age for Spain. Right, they became king of the hill, so to speak, because of all the money that they made from the New World, plundering the Aztecs and the Incas, but also in the silver mines in the subsequent years. However, in the century afterward, and actually centuries afterwards, uh, Spanish is going to face a number of different challenges. Uh, some of these challenges we've actually already identified in some cases. So on the one hand, we could say challenges from the New World itself. That is, to constantly need to put down rebellion of Native American populations. Uh, we'll talk about this more, but we saw this in the case of the Aztecs and the Inca resistance by the indigenous population. The second thing that we talked about is uh, the Protestant Reformation. That Spain, being a Catholic church, or sorry, a Catholic nation, was really responsible for trying to bring back a lot of these Protestants. So in Europe, Spain fought wars in the Netherlands, Spain fought wars with England, uh, and this was taxing on the various resources. The third challenge that we're going to talk about here specifically, and I'll go ahead and put it right here, is challenge from other nations. That is. Now that Spain, you know, Spain was the first nation to the New World, they signed a treaty with Portugal, but not long after you have countries like England, France, and the Netherlands. And how do those nat nations compete in the New World with Spain? Because these nations too, England, France, and the Netherlands, they certainly want to make, uh, you know, money as well. And as with all motivations, oops, as with all motives in the new world, we know that certainly wealth is a motive for these three nations. Let's go ahead and identify them here, right? We'll talk, we're going to talk about England, France, and the Netherlands. Uh, money is certainly a motivating factor, we know that, but uh, these nations are also motivated by, um, by religion, right? By religion. So let's look at the English first. Some of the earliest English explorers were privateers. We might think of them as pirates. And really what their goal was to do was to plunder or steal Spanish ships. And this was due to the large amount of silver that was being extracted out of the New World. One of these notable privateers was Sir Francis Drake, who sailed on behalf of England. England, again, being a Protestant nation, Spain being a Catholic nation. So religiously, there certainly was no love loss. Remember the Spanish Armada and the way that the English had defeated Spain uh, in that particular battle. However, the earliest colony for England was the colony of Roanoke, which is modern day North Carolina. And Roanoke was created or established in part with the help of Sir Walter Raleigh, who was one of these early English sponsors. I believe, in fact, the Queen had sponsored Sir Walter Raleigh to establish a colony in North Carolina. And its purpose was to steal Spanish silver. All right, so one of the very first uh, efforts by England to go to the New World was to try and steal some of the source of wealth. Uh, also, the colonists at Roanoke believed that they could exploit the native population in a similar way to which the Spanish had did. However, Roanoke ultimately failed, right? It's a failure of the colony. And this is going to be true of a lot of the early English colonies, is that England really struggles early on. Roanoke is perhaps the best uh, evidence of this. The only way that Roanoke survived was via supply ships. In other words, it was not self-sufficient. The people there could not properly uh, maintain themselves. 
in a lot of cases having to re rely upon not just the supply ships, but also the native or indigenous population there. Uh, when the Spanish Armada attacked in 1588, that disrupted the supply ships. And when the war was over by the 1590s, when English explorers and England uh, people arrived at Roanoke, everybody had vanished. Uh, still to this day, we don't know what happened to the people at the Roanoke colony, it's sometimes referred to as the lost colony because when those ships got back there again, it was completely abandoned. Uh, the only thing or clue that we have is this mysterious message that was carved into one of the trees that say Croatone. So if we think about early English colonization, we think about Roanoke, the inability to be self-sufficient, supply ships being disrupted, ultimately resulting in a failure, right? The first effort at England for England to colonize the New World. However, uh, England does eventually establish their first permanent colony, and that was with Jamestown. So we want to identify Jamestown as the first permanent English colony, and this is modern day Virginia, right? Modern day Virginia, so we can see that. Uh, Jamestown was established by a joint stock company, and the purpose of joint stock companies is to make money, right? So when we think about why does Jamestown exist, it exists to make money. A joint stock company is like a modern day corporation. So let's explain what a joint stock company is uh, quickly, right? So we've got joint stock company. So if we think back to some of the examples of how European merchants and entrepreneurs arrived in the new world, we can think about Columbus, right? And who sponsored Columbus's voyage? Well, that was the queen and the king. Right, they gave Columbus the money that was required for the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Uh, it's a very expensive venture to send, um, you know, somebody to the New World to buy all the ships, buy the food and water that's required for how many ever days that it takes. You know, sometimes two, three months, sometimes maybe even a year. Joint stock companies sought to solve that problem instead of seeking out one single patron like in the case of Spain, uh, Spain, right? One person to sponsor your voyage. What a joint stock company does is that that takes resources from many people. So instead, a lot of different investors, and we call them investors, pool all their money together to create the resources that are required. And this is essentially what a modern day corporation is, right? A company sells their stock, all of these people here then become all these individuals here then become stockholders, and if the uh, if the company makes money, right? If this smaller si a dollar sign turns into a big dollar sign, then all of these people become much richer. And it was really the English and the Dutch who were really good at utilizing these joint stock companies uh, in order to fund their merchant activity. And so Jamestown is created by a you know, by a company, the Virginia Company. And initially, they sought instant wealth in the form of gold and silver. That is, learning from what they thought, you know, thought they knew about the Spanish experience was that, well, you know, these Jamestown settlers, the 120 or so that left, they should be able to find instant gold, instant silver. They should be able to really force the native population to do whatever they want, to feed them, to provide later, et cetera, et cetera. However, we'll learn that that wasn't the case, right? But we'll get back to it in a little bit. Where the Jamestown colony was created was in the Chesapeake Bay. This is modern day Virginia and Maryland. And even though the colony really struggled early on and didn't find the gold and silver, which we'll talk about, it did become the first permanent colony. So that's good to know. And in some cases, if um, you know, if 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 you're a stickler for dates or need to know specific dates, 1607 is typically a good one to remember. 
again, that being the first permanent English colony in the New World. Uh, the English also had other colonies that they uh, created, uh, like the Portuguese and the Spanish and these other nations uh, in the West Indies, which is the Caribbean. Uh, they did control colonies like Barbados, which were sugar plantations and had African slavery. These were primarily money-making enterprises. Uh, for the most part, pretty much every single European country will come to have a sugar colony in the Caribbean in which they rely very heavily on African slavery. Uh, but if we look towards the north, uh, these English colonists, the Pilgrims and the Puritans, uh, they are coming to the New World for different reasons. Rather than the settlers of Roanoke and Jamestown and Barbados, they're not here for money. Uh, the Pilgrims and the Puritans are in the New World for religious reasons. So Puritans were a small religious group Right, and the Puritans are a religious group as well, right? Now they're pretty similar, but they're a little bit different. If we recall from the last section, what do Puritans want to do? Well, they want to purify the Church of England, right? That's to say the Church of England is a Protestant church, which is good, but it's still too Catholic and they want to purify some of those elements. Uh, pilgrims are a more extreme kind of form of uh, Puritans, and that is they don't want to just purify it. They instead want to completely separate it from the Church of England, right? The pilgrims are separatists. Uh, in other words, the Church of England is, you can't save it anymore, time to completely break away. And in heading to the New World, the pilgrims create the colony of Plymouth, which is located in modern-day Massachusetts. Uh, so that is the pilgrim colony that is created. Uh, the Mayflower is the ship that the pilgrims sail on. And it is during that voyage that the pilgrims agree to the Mayflower Compact, which is the first written government in the New World, right? First written government from a European country in the New World. And it's it's loosely, loosely sort of based off things like, you know, fair and just laws. Uh, you also have kind of a very vague notion of democracy in the Mayflower Compact. For, so for, um, for some, it's a significant document because it's one of the first, the first written governing document in, uh, in the New World. The Puritans are much larger in number and in fact, more important. Um, you know, the Pilgrims, that's the story of the first Thanksgiving, et cetera, et cetera. We may have heard of Plymouth Rock and the Mayflower. Historically speaking though, the Puritans are far more important because they come much larger in number. And the Puritan colony, instead of being Plymouth, is Massachusetts Bay. So this is the Puritan colony, right? And so when we look at New England, which is the term or the geographic location for Plymouth and Massachusetts versus the English colonies in the Chesapeake, right? we get a stark comparison of commercial versus religious interests in the New World. And it's important to understand that distinction, that there are some colonists that are there to make money, Roanoke, Jamestown, the Caribbean, and there are some colonists that are there really just to kind of live in their own religious community, the Puritans and the Pilgrims. And because of that, the colonies are going to develop in different ways, right? Those colonies will develop in different ways. In addition to England, and we'll get back to England and talk much, much, much more about England, uh, there's also a, a somewhat significant amount of French and Dutch colonization of the New World. Uh, again, each of these nations still trying to get their own piece of the pie. They both want to make money, the French and the Dutch, but they also have cultural and religious motives that are also pushing them. So in terms of France, France is primarily a Catholic nation. Uh, the king of France is Catholic, but there are a number of French Protestants. 
Remember, remember for the Protestant Reformation in France, it was civil war, right? So most French are Catholic, the king is Catholic, there are some French Protestants, right? And they're really trying to get out of the civil war and come to the new world. The French colony is New France. It's created along the St. Lawrence River. This is roughly in Eastern Canada, right? So if we wanna match these areas up to modern day geographic locations, we're gonna think about the Chesapeake Bay as being Virginia and Maryland. Of course, Massachusetts Bay colony is modern day Massachusetts. Uh, the French are primarily in Eastern Canada. Samuel de Champlain, considered to be the father of New France, helps to establish the capital city of Quebec. So whereas Mexico City is the capital of the Spanish Empire, Quebec is the capital of New France or the French Empire. And what Samuel de Champlain wants to accomplish, among other things, certainly there is a motive to make money, right? That's true. But perhaps more so than anything else, Champlain wants more of a, you know, he wants a good relationship with the native people. Uh, he wants to create kind of a utopian world, but runs into some obstacles. And one of the obstacles in achieving good relations between um, settlers and Native Americans are how tribal rivalries work in the New World prior to Champlain's uh, arrival. So for example, Champlain creates alliances with the Huron Indians and the Algonquians. And so the French are essentially able to build these alliances However, before the French even got there, the Huron and the Algonquian were at war with the Iroquois. And because the French have now allied themselves with the Huron and the Algonquian, what does that make them in the eyes of the Iroquois? It makes them the enemy. And so this image right here is a picture of Champlain despite his best efforts to try and make friendly relations with everybody in the New World, finding himself at war with the Iroquois due to some of the tribal differences, right? Due to the tribal differences. In terms of money, the French, because they have good relations, can make money off the fur trade. The fur trade involves Native Americans hunting and obtaining the furs and then giving it to French. And when you're on good terms, and out of all the nations, we could probably say that the French had the best relations with the indigenous population, even though it wasn't always perfect and couldn't always be perfect, uh, that the French make their money off of the fur trade. Whereas the Spanish make their money with the silver, the French make it with the fur trade. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the French as well, because along with this a Catholic nation, you also have the desire to convert, right? So the same way that Spanish missionaries went to the New World to find extra converts, the French do that as well. Whereas the English, and uh, you know, we'll get a little bit more to that, but if we look at groups like the Pilgrims and the Puritans, they're not they're not as much in the converting business. They they certainly want to seek out converts. But, you know, Catholics, especially in this particular period, are much further motivated by conversion and, and seeking out uh, more people to come to the faith. Think about the Reformation. You know, it was during the Reformation that, and go all the way up here, right? Protestant Reformation. Uh, you know, the Catholics had lost half their membership. And so there's a very strong desire to go out and seek more converts. And this is true of Catholic nations such as Spain and uh you know, Spain and, and France. Uh, lastly, we have the Dutch. And recall the Dutch gained their independence from Spain. Religiously, they are Protestant, so they're not as much interested perhaps in conversion. But the one thing to remember about the Dutch is that they are really the commercial leaders. If you were to summarize Dutch motivation for the new world, it's all about the money, right? The Dutch are in it for the money. 
uh, they build or create some of the most powerful joint stock companies the world had ever seen. In fact, the Dutch East India Company is the most profitable business ever to have existed, right? More profitable, more wealthy than Amazon today, Apple, any other company, Standard Oil, the Dutch East India Company was profitable. But for the most part, this East part right here clues you in that they are primarily interested in trading with Asia. In fact, most of what Portugal claimed, remember Portugal was the pioneer of the age of exploration, but Portugal wasn't necessarily you know, powerful, big, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, more or less the Dutch took that over, right? So the Dutch are really capitalizing on trade in Asia and building the world's wealthiest company that had ever existed. The Dutch West India Company though, that is what is interested um, in the new world. And the two commodities that the Dutch West India Company deals with, one is the fur trade. So in that sense, in terms of the fur trade, the French and the Dutch are rivals. While the French have the better relationship, the Dutch are a little bit better at business, so they offer the cheaper price, right? So in terms of the fur trade, do you go with the cheaper price, which are the Dutch, or do you go with someone you can trust, like the French? That's someone that that's something that Native Americans have to grapple with and deal with. Um, but also the slave trade, right? The slave trade, and the Dutch are heavily involved in the slave trade. The first African slaves were brought by Portugal. The Dutch take over much of that, and really in the 1600s, the Dutch are the primary facilitators of the Atlantic slave trade, and that comes to the New World. Geographically speaking, where is the Dutch colony? It's in modern day New York. What some of the early Dutch settlers were after was the Northwest Passage, which is a water route to Asia that even though the new world existed, there were still many ha that hoped you could sail across the river uh, and get to Asia where all those trade goods were. So in fact, a lot of the early explorers, including English and French, were continuing to look for this Northwest Passage. It exists, you can sail above Canada, but the waters are far too icy, it's far too risky. And even though many of these explorers keep sailing down all these rivers, hoping to pop out in the Pacific Ocean, they don't really find what they're looking for. It's why the French sailed down the St. Lawrence River. It's why Henry Hudson, who is the Dutch explorer, he's actually English, but he sails on behalf of the Netherlands, uh, ends up establishing uh, the Hudson River, which of course is, oops, uh, which of course is right where modern day New York is located. The Dutch colony, New Netherland, the city or capital is New Amsterdam. So in terms of interactions of the new world, uh, we can think of these various nations as competing with one another, but you essentially have, you know, England, Spain, the Dutch or the Netherlands, and France, right, who bring slaves from Africa and are all competing with the native population. Right, so it's a very complex relationship in the new world between all these different groups.